find, I think as we start talking, probably it'll but the 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 when I when I met the farm workers, it was, that was clear. You know, you're either going to be you're either going to be a big part of this yeah. of these lives, or you're not going to at all. And and the the work thing was so absolute. Mm -hmm. You know, the the dominance of crew bosses. Right? It's a it's a given, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. what defines farm wor workers is powerlessness. Right? That um, nobody knows what time. You're going to work in the morning until the bus toots the horn outside the door. Nobody knows if you're going to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. They won't do you the ordinary bloody courtesy of letting you know if there is work tomorrow, mm -hmm. where it is. When you get on the bus, you don't know where you're going. And you don't know for how many hours you're going. Mm -hmm. And um, so from day one, from the, day, from the time people put themselves in the hands of a coyote you know, to come up here, mm -hmm. that, that's the thing that defines the, the done. And the crew boss was was really um, the only figure and defined everything. I was having situations where, uh, in terms of just of church things, right, where crew boss didn't release the bride to come to her own wedding. Uh, where, when we were going to baptize kids, the crew boss would show up as the padrino, right, the godfather. All the time, mm -hmm. people uh, people had to go to the crew boss to be the to, to be the godfather. Yeah, right? yeah. And that was that, that might have been immediate kind of e economic benefit, you know, that he'd pay for whatever kind of a celebration they had afterwards. But but more than that, it was the idea that with you know the compadre mm -hmm. relationship means mm -hmm. a tremendous. Uh, we, we don't even it doesn't even occur to us how much it means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Just the power compadre. Like when people greet one another, one, uh, one another, when when the father of a family greets the guy who is the godfather of one of his children, he calls him. From that day on, he always calls him compadre. He mm -hmm. never, mm -hmm. he never. Uh, they're no longer friends. Right? Mm -hmm. They're they're in a relationship that that, mm -hmm. uh, that that we do we don't have anything reflecting that at all in our society. Yeah. And so, and so to the obviously the attempt involved in trying to make the crew boss the compadre was an attempt to protect your family and protect your kids. Yeah. 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 So, oh, and uh, I remember it went, it, went, it went along for a little while until the crew boss said to me one day, as we were just finishing, he started this whining and, and he pressed the kill. And he says, brother, what's the matter with our people? What is the matter with our people? I've got all these you know, slouches over there guzzling beer in the camp and blah, 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 blah. why don't they pick themselves up and get mm -hmm. this together and all this going on about the young men and I, said, and I just flipped out and I, <laughs> what role model do they have except a son of a bitch like you and, <laughs> and so on and just went, went completely <laughs> over the top and uh, so that was the end of <laughs> this guy coming in, coming in as the. Uh, he was running the the blue camp, at that, which they call it now. He was running that that housing on the other side of the tracks there, the double decker thing, mm -hmm. for uh, keeping crews there for an outfit that at that time was called American Food, and uh, just absolutely, totally dominated the people's lives. And so, mm -hmm. one of my. One of my first little marks of success was the night when we had a an open air dance mm -hmm. in front of the church there, and the during the night it was Mexican Independence Day, which was really dumb on my part. But, mm -hmm. but uh, during the night people started firing pistols, and so I, I had the guys there run around and put an end to it. But when it came to midnight, they just went <laughs> crazy. Right? And all night long, the crew boss sat there in a deck chair with the bottle on, on the ground beside him mm -hmm. and, so, and, and presided. And you could get it. When, when he got up to dance, people stood and watched. Mm. It was astonishing to see the authority. But 
anyway, the, uh, when, when, the, when, the, when the guns really started going off at midnight, I, I went over to the band and said, last, last thing, it's over, good night, you know, go finish this tune and we're out of here. Uh -huh. And uh, so then he set in on me. You see who wrecked the evening? Uh -huh, right? uh -huh. These, right? These young Turks, uh, whom you've got sucking on your thumb. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right? And he, and all this bile comes out, and it, and I was thrilled. Man, right? it was the first time it had never occurred to me that we had actually impacted the system at all uh -huh, uh -huh. until that moment, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. And then he starts with all of his resentment about the fact that just having this little service center in town had undercut his authority. Mm -hmm. And how did it do it? In the smallest ways, it just meant that a fellow with a family who fell over the crew boss had no recourse, nowhere to go, mm -hmm. and so on. But with just this little service entry there, you could afford to fight with him. Yeah. You yeah. know, you could. Um, right. And just, it was, it was all mighty small stuff, but, mm -hmm. it, but it had that. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes those are the most, I mean, those little things like that that change those relationships show people that yeah. other things can be changed, too. So those are, those are things I we're struggling for sometimes. Exactly. And, and you, you know, you wouldn't, um, I, w I was the guy who went up there thinking, you know, the union was it. Right? And until we had the union, we had nothing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, the, and then something like that comes along. And the, when, the f when I, when I, when I got the two nuns, I'd been there 12 months, and as luck would have it, on the same day, two pairs of nuns showed up. Mm -hmm. And uh, one pair were these uh, activist sisters who were working with the farm workers, Pearl McGivney. you got to meet Pearl McGivney mm -hmm. and Delicia. And who lived with the farm workers, worked as farm workers, and were totally give, dedicated to the unionization. Mm -hmm. um, has, Pearl had spent a lot of time working in California with, with the UFW, and um, they were looking me over to see if they would consider working with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the same day, these two Sisters of the Sacred Heart came in. Now, they, 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 the Sisters of the Sacred Heart were run in the poshest Catholic schools in the nation, right? and all the head, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, were, and were terrifically well educated and all that kind of thing, and this was a complete uh, in innovation for some of them to be doing mm -hmm, this, mm -hmm. this kind of work. And to my own astonishment, by the time the day is over, I want the, I want the two Sacred Heart Sisters, and not the two Union people. Um, I don't know if the union people would have come to me anyway, but yeah, yeah. but the reason the reason was it had by in in the course of twelve months I, I, I had decided that the that the timer powers and the power safeguards and all the rest of it, the folk inside that community who were um, who had some kind of a vision for the place were were necessary to the whole thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and. That uh, and that the purely adversarial thing right, wasn't wasn't going to do it. Um, that was one piece of it. Another piece of it was that the uh, um, as t as things panned out, of course, there was no future for the union here anyway. And give him credit, Cesar Chavez was really upfront about that. Always, mm -hmm. never ever gave anybody in Florida the impression that he was the answer to Florida's problems. Mm -hmm. um, but somewhere in around that same time, he stayed with me one time. And, 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 and he was the one who would be dismayed, you see, when people started laying hopes on his program that, that he just knew they could never deliver. And, and, and he said uh, it cost $20,000 20 million dollars to get us set up in California, paid by the big unions. Mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. It would cost 40 million dollars in Florida. Right? There are no big unions 
that are going to pay it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what was it's, the problem? It's not going to happen. Why, why was Florida was Florida any different than California, or say Texas, other than it just need, the resources were greater, or was there? There's something different about the, the workers or the jobs. Okay, workers are a lot different in Florida than California. When, you, when I first went down to Texas Valley, I was astonished to find that there were Mexican-Americans at every level. That there were, mm -hmm. when I first met, I met, when I first met Mexican-American social workers, I was uh, surprised. Mm -hmm. you know, when I, uh, but they were there, they're there at every level of the society. Mm -hmm. Florida, in Florida, no such thing existed. Um, but the, the uh, just the elementary levels of, of, of development uh, of, of community leadership and so on mm -hmm. didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And then the then there was the, the but then we were right to work state. We had a legislature that actually contemplated making it a crime to advocate um, farm worker organizing. I mean, actually discussed the bill. Right? <laughs> Um, I remember when, one time we sent thousands and thousands of letters to a fellow called Tucker, who was the Speaker of the House, or whatever at the time, mm -hmm. and were, uh, and everybody was amazed that we were able to muster. It was, it was, it was when uh, this was still at the stage when people like Teddy Kennedy were getting up, addressing the Democratic Convention as fellow lettuce boycotters, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we were able to generate massive, some massive amounts of mail and so on to Tallahassee which gave the impression that there was a lot more organization there than ever really existed. But, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but uh, there was that. The, you're going to talk to somebody else about the prior attempts at unionizing, right, and belt laid and so on, completely disastrous. The crew bosses took the money, right, and upped the peace rates you know, as long as the money was there. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And then the whole thing was all over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the, there was no Jerry Brown in Florida. I don't, I don't know that there would ever have been a, a union in California if it hadn't been for Jerry Brown. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you certainly had some. You had a, a middle class out there that would intervene on the. Well, first of all, he gave. Yeah, but for, he gave them a piece of law where they could work with yeah. the thing, you know, yeah. which, uh, which the, when Jack Manning took it away, they weren't able to survive. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, but the, I suppose if you're anyway, they, Caesar was not holding out any real hopes at all. There was, there was no, there was no pretense that it could be done. And um, it's the same that we went on believing. But you quickly got past the stage. I used to go to meetings where what we did was bash everybody who wasn't a union organizer. Mm -hmm. They bash everybody else who purported to be interested in the welfare of farm workers and ask them why the hell are you why are you working at that job when you ought to be organizing mm -hmm. you know, um, that had happened with with the the ministers in the Protestant church groups that were doing so um, farm worker ministries you know, they had gone over to that mm -hmm. there was a time when all the small churches all of the like all the Methodist churches and so on were in, in rural areas were all committed to Florida farm worker organizing. Mm -hmm. The Farm Bureau crowd just did an excellent job of reorganizing and taking over all of those church women united groups and all the rest of it and, and straightening all of that out very well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a remnant of it still in Karen Woodall. Do you know Karen? Mm -hmm. There's a thing called Florida Impact, which is a Protestant lobbying group in Tallahassee and up to a couple of years ago, Karen Woodall was the one who ran it. She's she's still a farm worker lobbyist in Tallahassee, mm -hmm. and uh, she's going to run for office up there right right now. But if you're in touch with Rob Williams, mm -hmm. you, you'll be in touch with Karen Woodall, and she can nobody could 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 do better at giving you the legislative mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. than than her. Mm -hmm. um, where the hell was I going to? Let me let me back up a little bit. One, there's one thing I'm interested in, if, if however much you want to talk about it, is how did you when you were growing up, say when you went to seminary, did you, did you envision this kind of role for yourself? I'm wondering. You know, I have a I have a 
tomorrow, tomorrow night I have a confirmation, you know, yeah. here for uh, 45 Irish tinkers, you know, itinerants. Yeah. Now, I don't know how many generations it's been since since they left Ireland, but they they continue to be itinerants, uh -huh. and they they're not gypsies mm -hmm. in, in that they're not they don't belong to those European gypsy nations, yeah. you know, but but they're they've always been around, and the very first Sunday morning that I stood in front of a church here, which was down Military Trail here in West Palm Beach, and was at that time the absolute western edge of the town. Uh, up out of the parking lot up here, these blazing red heads over pasty white faces with big, big freckles. And I, and I looked and I said, geez, they're, they're tinkers. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I mean, it was just instantly, yeah, uh -huh. reacted. Me. And sure enough, they were. They were, they were a wonderful fellow called Tom Riley. His, his, his family coming in, and uh, they. Uh, so I've got, I've got, uh, I've kind of had a little bit of contact with them ever since. Um, so they're gathering now from um, all over the place, uh -huh. like around the southeast here tomorrow night. And, ab and about 45 of them are going to receive their confirmation because they're pretty much outside the structure. They have towns of their own. There's a place called Murphyville in Georgia and mm -hmm. so on where they check in. And the, the young people still get married very, very early. Mm -hmm. you know, and nobody fights them on it. Uh, on that, like the church here gives people such a hassle now. You, 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 it's hard for somebody to get married in the Catholic Church anymore. They put you through so many loops before they say yes. Uh -huh. you know. They, um, nobody argues with them about these early marriages or anything else because the community life is such that all of this stuff works. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They, they really take care of one another. Uh -huh. And uh, when they're on the phone here, they'll talk about somebody who's sick out in Texas. And everybody in Florida is all worrying to death about somebody out in Texas and making provision for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they keep it. In Ireland, they're on the roads. How the devil anybody can live, okay. You know, can you imagine an Irish weather living on the roads? Yeah. And so on. They refuse to be settled down. There have been all kinds of programs all throughout my lifetime trying to get them to settle down, and housing has been built. And uh -huh. so at the first ray of sunshine in spring, man, they're on the road again. <laughs> so, uh, rural Irish people, like, like Ireland has changed radically since I was there. But, but Irish people would never say no to a tinker. Uh -huh. It was a religious matter. Uh -huh. And when, when this lady in her shawl with a baby under her arm knocked on a farmhouse door in, and, and asked for flour, she parked off with half the flour in the house, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or sugar, or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, now, I grew up, born in 1941, I grew up uh, in what was a real, really tough post-war climate there, right? mm -hmm. where there was still a lot of rationing and all the rest of it. But it would never occur to somebody if a tinker woman knocked on the door and asked for tea not to give her half the tea in the house. And tea was very heavily rationed, yeah. expensive, or half the sugar. They, in the full knowledge that another one may show up next day. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was, now that, that so there, th th I think that means something. Mm -hmm. now, I, now my crowd weren't weren't that rural or anything, and they weren't necessarily that much, uh, they certainly weren't kind of traditional mm -hmm. in that they, that they have a, but the climate was there everywhere. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. And, uh, so the, 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 the downside of all of that is that at the end of, uh, of a market day type of thing, uh, cops would go out and just absolutely brutalize these people and drive them off the streets uh -huh, uh -huh. and drive them out of town and they, with, with a terrific show of brutality, you know, uh, beating drunk men over the heads as they just fell and bled right in front of them. You know, so. And I remember that as, a, as, a, as part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but they, <laughs> when, uh, when, when, I, when occasionally I had an argument with 
of my some of my confreres around the place about bothering people with this quote social gospel kind of thing and all the rest of it. I I've I've often found myself uh, you know, taking a guy on and saying, you know, where the hell did you get your religious thing? Mm -hmm. You know, what it wasn't from devotions and pieties, it was from this real stuff mm -hmm. that was just that your people like your father and mother took for granted. And um, so it was a bit of a, a, a something like that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but in my case, it was all pretty uh, accidental. I arrived into that church down in West Palm Beach, and farm workers began to show up there. Mm -hmm. And I had no, I had no context at all for any of this. No idea. Mm -hmm. First of all, I didn't know what I, what I was. You were young. You, you I was count. 23 years old. Yeah. Right? I looked like I was 17. <laughs> People were coming in. You know, some guy was bringing his wife in for marriage counseling, and he was dropping dead when he saw this kid. Right, sitting behind a desk. <laughs> but I had a. People were coming up and to the church, and uh, I, I know it, 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 it sounds a little over dramatized, but they were coming with dead babies in those early days because they, that, was the, that was the era of the uncapped wells. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the. Uh, and the, and the parathion poisoning in the camp. Yeah. Right, the, where there was storage of, ke of chemicals and so on, and, and it was all very badly handled, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so there were lots, there were a lot of problems. So these were people coming in. They were Mexicans from the migrant areas. Coming, from right, from yeah, they were. The I was just yeah. south of Southern Boulevard down here, and there were people living right out on Southern Boulevard in camps and so. Yeah. And so I just was beginning to get a hang of it. I I didn't have the language really. I didn't have anything to offer. I had a clue what was going on. And so yeah. But I remember, I remember the the uh, the kind of figure who would. I'd meet him at the funeral home, and I remember the figure who would pass the hat and uh, collect the money to pay the funeral home, and, um, all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, um, people weren't allowed in town then. Now this was like I, September '65. I arrived, and and they. They were discouraged from being in town, and of course, and there was no missing the car with the uh, with the tassels around the windshield, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they, and so the cops would just run them out of town all the time. Just that was a reflex of mm -hmm. Delray Beach, Boynton Beach, and up along the way there, they mm -hmm. would just chase them out of town. Mm -hmm. Here it was rather like my Irish pinto scene, right, right. and uh, and then you began to gather that. That the preference of the crew bosses was for having people do company store stuff. You know, that they liked to supply not only the housing and so on, but the food mm -hmm. and so on. And that the and that that was all part of their leverage over the people. And that and that uh, the, the rule of thumb was that as little money as possible should change hands. Mm -hmm. and they, uh, oh. um, so then, I um, but now I wasn't I, w I wasn't really I into the thing. But I began to do little bits and pieces. There was a there was a community in Westgate, which is the south side of Okeechobee Road here, mm -hmm. and uh, there was an old Pentecostal minister who had a big. Uh, who had a lot of housing there. No electricity, no water. I think just desperate like a place outside the city mm -hmm. limits. Right? And when the people came back off the stream, they'd come to us for their uh, the initial rent payments and so on. Mm -hmm. It was $25, which in 19, then was a good deal. I was yeah, yeah. getting 100 a month myself. Yeah. And, um, So we'd always pay the twenty-five dollars, and, and at the same time, I'd always call the health department and make a complaint mm -hmm. about, the, about the sewage running down the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This kind of thing. They'd give them a couple of days' notice. Somebody would, uh, the wife of this guy, would walk down the street with a couple of bottles of Clorox or something and pour it as she walked down the street, and, yeah. and that satisfied the, the county. Um, they, a lot of that housing is still there. They've had they've had fires and that thing 
relatively recently. Mm. We, um, then it was a nun called Aquinas. Mm. And Aquinas was also Irish uh, in the community of, of Americans down here. But she, but Aquinas was just constant to fatigue people. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't drive. So she always had to hustle a ride, and then she would come after guys like me for for help. She would uh, go around and browbeat parish priests into giving her mm -hmm. money and old clothes and so on, and, and uh, this extraordinary single-handed kind of a thing mm -hmm. by this Mother Teresa figure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She became a, just a, she just became very big for me. Mm -hmm. She's uh, um, and she would round me up then for uh, visits to the people's homes and trying to do church stuff with them. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't good at it. First of all, I didn't have language. But I was most, mostly the th Spanish. These were all, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I wasn't well disposed to to walk into one of these hovels mm -hmm. where the, the smell of urine was absolutely overwhelming. Yeah. You know, and to and to stick to everything you touched, you know, to sit to sit in a chair and know that you were going to stick to it. Mm -hmm. Every time you moved to stick. Every I never never in my life picked up a baby in a house like that that didn't pee on me. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. I've never failed him. And um, yeah uh, and I was always you know, I wasn't a bit happy to be offered food, right? and, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and Aquinas was just marvelous at this, breezing through this, and organizing kids from, there's a Catholic high school called Cardinal Newman down there, organizing those kids to take care of um, after-school activities with them, do a little bit of mm -hmm. uh, homework, and so, uh, so on with the kids. Uh, just really kind of pioneering all that kind of yeah, stuff because yeah, none of us, awesome. nobody knew it and nobody, nobody had any handles on what ought to be done or how to do it or anything else. And, kind of learning and, as you go. And, uh, so, but she was the great presence in the thing. Mm -hmm. um, I remember she, she finally got herself uh, a station wagon at, at some stage, came out of a meeting, um, was followed out the door by this terrifically authoritarian bishop we had at the time, Coleman Carroll. Right? As she was about to back out of her slot, saw him standing there looking at her, you know, so she reverses directly into the car behind her, right? goes forward and into the car in front, knock, knocks out three cars in a matter of a minute, you know? and so on, because he couldn't drive at all. You know, he's shot and got that woman out of that car. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, he's paying for the insurance things, for instance. <laughs> but the, it was, that was how she did it. Just one day she goes in because she was having trouble with her vocal cords of some sort, and the doctor says, "I can't, uh, can't operate on her because, because this woman is so exhausted physically uh -huh. that she is a 90-year-old. You know, she was probably 50, and she had just." Completely kind of spent herself yeah. uh, in what wasn't very organized stuff, right? but just being a presence yeah. with yeah. the people. And so then I had a few folk myself uh, who would who would um, do similar kinds of things. There's one woman, Anna Haney, who was a, um, a Cuban mm -hmm. and had uh, a Cuban who had lived her entire life in the United States. Her family owned hotels here or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, just a desperate alcoholic and so on. But, and then in between bouts, you know, she would do a lot of good stuff. And so organized, we'd go out Southern Boulevard. And she'd, she had people who would go out there in the morning when the kids were supposed to be getting on the school buses. They'd get out there ahead of that mm -hmm. and meet the kids and put clothes on them. Because a lot of the migrant kids would come out of the housing ostensibly to go to school. 
So when the bus came along, they would turn shy and they would hide in the ditch and not get on board because they didn't have shoes or they didn't have whatever because they were going to be ridiculed by the other kids in science fiction. It was that informal kind of stuff. Kid carrying stuff around in the trunk of the car and just putting it on the kids right then and there. And okay. Then they would proudly get on the bus uh -huh. and go on into school. Uh -huh. you know? um, they. That's why. Um, so it, it's, it would. Yeah, I mean, nobody had any big. Nobody had any big philosophy about this. Right. 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 They were just responding to. People and um, it's, but it, but it, 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 in the case of any of those people, myself included, it's religious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's a sense of, you know, I if I have an overriding kind of thing, it's that this whole arrangement is a is a lie about life. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And in the farm worker situation, that's all you're saying to people. You're saying this is a damn lie about life. This is a lie about you. This is a lie about God. This is a lie about everything, mm -hmm. and um, and we and we just have to show the like show the face of God in this mm -hmm. and put, mm -hmm. put something in that makes sense. So I don't have any really fancy yeah, elaboration no, of the thing. Um, it's a pretty sophisticated one. Where the. Um, that's a gut thing, mm -hmm. and you and you go along. Um, it it all changes uh, when you start when you when you're around the people, and it takes on other kinds of dimensions of the mm -hmm. I started off. I went from West Palm Beach into Miami, Hialeah, and was what I was doing was the advocacy stuff. The I met the uh, USW people. And the very, the very first day that I met him, they, they had a, a program on Channel Two, public television, a, a half-hour call-in program. Mm -hmm. And I met him at, a, at, at lunchtime, and that evening, their uh, their hotshot, he was at that time Cesar Chavez's right-hand man, was supposed to do the program. And I went with him to the studio for the program. And he didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And the organizer, a young American woman, and he was he was a he was a Chicano, mm -hmm. Robbie Jaffe, was this young, typical of that period, right? She had been she had become involved with him at at, at the university, mm -hmm. and she had come to Miami to be the organizer on the spot in Miami. Uh, with the assistance of a few farm workers who would come in from California, so. and uh, so Robbie put me on the the on the the, to the call in show, uh -huh. oh. and I remember just uh, taking all <laughs> all of the propaganda material that I'd seen for the first time at uh, midday uh -huh. yeah, and spreading it out on the desk in front of me, uh -huh. and. Uh, they had a set of photographs. Um, a fellow at the Palm Beach Post had won a Pulitzer for photographs of migrant workers in yeah. Pahokee. And, so. mm -hmm. and so these things were put on an easel, and they were just the camera focused on those as an intro, mm -hmm. and they were just tipping them off the easel. You know. mm -hmm. And I, um, and while that was going on, I was reading <laughs> off the farmworker statistics off the notes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, the, the very first call was a guy from the Department of Labor who uh, crunched me with whatever kind of a question he had. You know, and, and, and I remember like that kind of, that instant where his statistic is the fine years and, and he's going, to, you know, and, and you're going to come off like a a liar, mm -hmm. right away, and mm -hmm. so and, and then then saying, 
well, is it true that, and 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 all the rest of it, and the guy suddenly disappeared off the air. And <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was interesting. Then we started going around doing that, trying to build up a constituency for the for the whole farm worker thing. And mm -hmm. it, uh, it was marvelous. The, thing, the, the, the big problem I had with it was I was just going, um, but that you could really browbeat people with this stuff. It was, yeah. And I'm afraid I'm prone to doing things like that. <laughs> and I would be, I'd be standing in front of a group, the uh, Miami Business Women's Association or something, doing this stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it turned out that it was a cinch to get everybody to jump in their purse and come up with five or ten dollars. Or whatever. What we were trying to do was get them to join the boycott and make resolutions supporting the boycott. And mm -hmm and notice back into the kitchen that was just serving the meal that they wouldn't have the lettuce, thank you. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> um, the, uh, but I, but I, found it, I found that it was, it was very tough. They had a lot of burnout among their people and so on, and we'd have the, these long discussions, and I was always saying to them, this is a nonviolent movement, you know, and we, if we don't do violence to people, you know, we'll we'll last. You know, we've got to be more, you know, more careful about how we present present the whole thing, and not browbeat people, and try to offer them avenues and where they can have a real response. And da -da -da -da. but the truth was that that's pretty thin soup. Mm -hmm. um, going around doing advocacy stuff. Um, they we had great successes, and we had thirty five thousand people. I think it was turn up for. Fit of Chavez rallies in Miami, yeah, yeah. Um, and of course I loved the crowd, the uh, the the people I was working with. You know, I loved being around all of these y young idealistic people who had come, who had picked up on this thing. Um, we had, uh, but there was the, the, the that was the, the that was the only kind of nurture in it. That wasn't. Uh, it was not mm -hmm. by a long shot. And there, were, and there were big mistakes in it. The farm workers would arrive in from California, entire like, families, like, one stage, like 10 or 15 families at once, you know, to work on the boycott. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, bringing with them all the bloody tensions and problems and everything else that that kind of thing entailed, being stuck into very inadequate kind of housing arrangements. And um, I can spend time doing this if you want me to, because it was, it was a big piece of that whole strategy, mm -hmm. you know, they, it was romantic as the devil initially, people just got on the trains out of California and rode them to wherever the grapes were going, and the mm -hmm. lettuce was mm -hmm. going, mm -hmm. and found themselves, you know, unloading in Boston or unloading in Chicago and so on, and getting off at that point and going right out and starting to organize a boycott, mm -hmm. you know, it was very amazing stuff. But mm -hmm. But the up close reality of that kind of thing, when you had whole families, um, some of them living in church basements, you know, nearly sink the basement there, mm -hmm. um, it was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. These people were experiencing real difficulties. Well, what do you do, you know, when in the middle of your model families, you find and you got a wife beater or something? It was, yeah. just, it was really quite extraordinary. And this is the, these are the kind of, this is their kind of organizational structure of the that they were using. That was the UFW thing. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it was yeah. marvelous. Old Caesar himself riding around the country on these endless fasts. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, he's back very, he had a bad back from the work to begin with, but he's back very badly deteriorated because of the fasting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, actually riding in a hammock in the back of a van and constantly only standing up long enough to speak. Um, it had a, it was it 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 it, it had a, a very unreal side to it. Yeah. You can talk to some of those people. So there's a guy called Jerry Brown at FIU who was part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that strategy became. I mean, you could it didn't after a while that that kind of strategy didn't seem like it was going to be. Then I used to go up into the field. Yeah. And I was I was really hilarious in the field. Frankly, I I show up in a town where. Um, where ostensibly farm workers were organized, and you discover that they, they, and there's a hiring hall, 
-hmm. and people are coming through the hiring hall every morning, you know, and being dispatched. Mm -hmm. so, and they're, when they come up to the counter, they hand in their name. Right? Different guy every morning handing in the same name. Right? And so the crew bosses were just running people through, mm -hmm. and they. Um, thing was a bit of a farce. Now, yeah. now it's coming up to a stage where you're going to have, where you're going to need a vote at Coca-Cola, and they, uh, and nobody has any assurance at all about how this thing is going to go because, because um, the fact is you don't actually have a solid workforce. Right. So mm -hmm. then it start going out into the field and talking to the workers. By then, I could be understood in Spanish and could pretty much understand what they were saying to me. Mm -hmm. But American black workers couldn't figure out what the hell they were saying to me. I was fine while I was talking, but when they asked me a question, I didn't know what they were saying. Marvelous. This was it was great stuff. Um, I, I, as, a, as a kid, I'd listen to the boxing matches mm -hmm. on the radio, mm -hmm. right, which meant in Ireland that you sit up all night. Listen to the fight, mm. and uh, I was full of this Muhammad Ali, Sonny Liston kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And Sonny Liston's hands, which were bigger than ham, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I go out in the groves, and a guy shakes my hand, and my hand feels like a pencil mm -hmm. in his, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And his calluses are bigger than my fingers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and I and I'm watching these guys picking oranges. I remember him just knocking them off the trees, you know, just bringing them all down and then just picking them up. And where I would be going, one, two, three, four, five, you know, into the bag, mm -hmm. and these guys were going <laughs> a dozen <laughs> oranges at a time. Uh -huh. It was extraordinary. Like it's just magnificent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, so loving the guys, you see, full of all kinds of uh, just, you know, Amazement at them, or awe. Or yeah. um, and um, and feeling like we were pretty much on the same wavelength about all this kind of thing, and mm -hmm. uh, but not uh, rather difficult to sit and do the kind of thing that you want to do there, which is hear them out, listen to their stuff, mm -hmm. um, get the so I missed a lot. I missed the whole business where you could have had a very rich kind of. Uh, these guys could have, you know, could have had marvelous rich stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was easier with white farm workers, obviously. And and there were still plenty of white farm workers around. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it began to be easier with the Hispanic crowd, you know, mm -hmm. to, to sit around. Um, but I never did. That was. It's one of the marks of this whole thing that you have a guy here, and chances are, if some coaches get their hands on his son, that they're going to have run him in the Olympics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this, like, just magnificent, bloody, incredible human specimen is mm -hmm. out there picking damn oranges, uh, and is and is a mule, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a valued less than a mule. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they, and then it, it, and is displaced the very first time that a more exploitable worker appears. Yeah. He's off. He's finished. First time that you get. Um, so, you know, so you're going. You're, he hasn't a ghost of a chance of hanging on to his job when a five foot Guatemalan shows up, for whom it is sudden death to go up a thirty foot ladder with ninety five pounds of oranges hanging around his neck. Yeah. Right? And and but it, but but the guy has has no recourse against that because because the the measure of desirability in the groves is your vulnerability to exploitation. You know, that's, that's yeah, that's um, I I the latest the latest study must be cockeyed. I can't, you know there's a Department of Labor study very recently. On the makeup of farm workers in the country right now, and it has to be crazy because everybody in the study is Mexican. But um, they, if you go up, once you go up Port Pierce and all the way up to Apopka, you'll find there are tons of black farm workers.
things I tried to do a few years ago was try to get people to fight H2. The H2 is the program under which people come in to fight oh, the Sugar yeah. King. Yeah. Workers who brought in to do a specific task which ostensibly no American is willing or able to do mm -hmm. right, for with, a, with, a, uh, with an H2 visa which only lasts as long as their employer wants them and then they're sent back. Mm -hmm. And Belblade is the H2 town. Belblade is, mm -hmm. is, is no, not Edward R. Morrow's Belblade, which was, uh, which is now an immokalee, right? The, the really labor-intensive vegetable thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but the post Castro Sugar Company town, mm -hmm. where the uh, um, where the Americans were just thrown out because a more vulnerable worker was available, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, I was going on for a long time trying to say to any black organization that would listen that the, that the expansion of H where uh, people either make their income at, at harvesting or they supplement their income anyway, right, in wow. a big way, at harvesting. But H2 expansion hasn't actually happened. Uh, we keep, keep waiting for it, and that's in the grand scheme, mm -hmm. what the industry imagines it will do. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, it's just, it, it's one of those things like mechanization. It's one of those things that um, seems inevitable. It always, always seems inevitable, but they haven't crossed over yet because this year the expenses don't merit it. Right, right, right. They haven't um, had to do it. Yeah. Mm. And they, um, um, but those, and, they, and those, those fellows, they, they've been displaced anyway. They've been displaced by the most recently arrived people. Dur during my time, somewhere in the 70s, the, a few breakthroughs were made in terms of minimum wage for farm workers. Mm -hmm. uh, they, had a far they had it, a, when I started out, they did have, there was a special farm worker minimum wage, which applied in special circumstances, and that, that sort of, uh, that in reality, wasn't there at all. But when they were brought in under the, the, the regular minimum wage, and when workers' protection came along, for farm workers, um, thanks largely to like Florida Rural Legal Services guys, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. when they began to emerge, the the industry simply switched off using mm. American workers, mm. and the the uh, citrus combines that used to recruit actively in Mississippi and Arkansas and all over the place, mm -hmm. you, uh, simply stopped going there, yeah. and they and and initially, like they, they uh, the the thing was that they were going to the Texas Valley instead, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, uh, which is a euphemism for bringing in illegals. Right, going but, further, further south. but they had um, uh, from the beginning. I had known the people I had known were. Down here were were Tex-Mex, mm -hmm. and and then more Mexican workers coming in, mm -hmm. and the crew bosses that I knew were were Tex-Mex, you mm -hmm. know, Chicanos, mm -hmm. um, and um, in those days, the like, I wasn't around for vagrancy laws. Somebody had to take you through the vagrancy law bit, mm -hmm. where crews were rounded up by the sheriff's department and then the and then the employers went in and bailed everybody out and took them to now I think I was around for some of it in relation to um, Immokalee mm. because but I'm not you know I don't have any clear stuff in it but I remember Immokalee with the with winos on the streets mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trying to get back to Miami and they they would have been taken out of Miami wh when they had been picked up on a drunk. Mm -hmm. They'd already they'd have done a, a few weeks out in the fields by now, mm -hmm. and now they would have drifted back into town in my in the Mockley and they would be would be trying to get back. Mm -hmm. um, so I do remember that part of it. You don't see them in the streets in the Mockley now uh, as then, but uh, but the Mockley still has 
you'll go to a Mockley, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they, oh yeah, you've got it, because that, I think that is, that's the old fruit and vegetable town that Bell Glade was when Ed Edward R. Morrow Mockley. captured it. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, it's, the, the, the sisters of Osme Mockley run this big soup kitchen, which oh. has got to be the biggest soup kitchen there is, you know, uh -huh. in the sense of, in terms of the numbers and stuff. Mm -hmm. I used to go there, and 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 you could spend half your day just making sandwiches for people. You know, mm -hmm. um, the anyway, I mean, I I think I basically missed the whole vagrancy law bit. Yeah. But then came a similar role to my mind by the border patrol, which would show up to move people along. Not deport people, yeah. but give them uh, extended voluntary departure. Right? Or um, they, when they grab them, they would simply have them sign the voluntary departure papers, and the people would go. It wasn't extended voluntary departure; it was just voluntary departure. Mm -hmm. They would give them. Uh, so they would agree to be out of the country in three weeks, mm -hmm. right? which only meant to move up the road. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, that was the only time I think that they saw them. Hmm. I don't remember that they saw that there was any, that there was any other real border patrol activity except mm -hmm. that kind of mm -hmm. shuffle them along now and get them moving stuff. Mm -hmm. They the, the the big change came with Reagan and a campaign called Operation Jobs. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Early in the Reagan era, when the economy took a downturn. The line was that we were losing, um, Americans were losing jobs to these workers right. who were coming from overseas. Right. And, and the automobile workers in Detroit beat up the Chinese guy that they met on the street and killed yeah. him because, oh, that's right. because right. they were angry right. at right. Japanese right. cars. Right. Right. Well, we had. Um, That, that was an extraordinary era. Rob Williams would describe it well. For, you know, by, he would describe it mockily well. Uh -huh. uh, people didn't come out of their homes for a week because the border patrol was in town. And it was just this terrific rain of terror. You know. People were not. People were putting their kids to bed at night, mm -hmm. and then they were going out and sleeping in the woods. In, in they were get up. In, well, in anticipation of the border patrol coming and kicking on the door in the morning. And. Uh, Um, in any time, people would always come and get you when something was going on. So you'd go down to the Roach Palace, and they, they would have roasted everybody out of bed. Mm -hmm. We'd be loading them into the vans. And I remember a woman screaming at this big, tall uh, Texan, you know, Border Patrol man, you know, how did you get into a filthy line of work like this? You know? <laughs> And he says, beats the hell out of roping cattle in Texas, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the, that's one whole piece of it. That's one whole piece of any study of the, of the thing is mm -hmm. the, the uses of immigration law mm -hmm. right. to keep a group of people who are um, probably... Uh, like whom it is anticipated and it will, will be upwardly mobile mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, from leaving right. these lower echelon jobs. Right. Right. The, the, use, the, the whole game, we went through this entire business of the, 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 the writing of that vast immigration reform and control act mm -hmm. and, and the clear like, ambivalence of the country about what it's to do with the thing. They know that they need not less than a half a million young workers a year, yeah. right? uh, probably higher than that. They know that, uh, that the only argument is about on what terms they're supposed to come in. Yeah. The question is whether you're, not going, whether you're going to allow them to, uh, if they're going to have papers, they're not long for agriculture. Right. Right? Right. Uh, not as agriculture is set up now. Right? And so they... Uh, so the California growers, in the course of all that debate, 
never wanted anything else but what they currently had, mm -hmm. which was this this informal flow of workers right. back and forth. Right, right. They, the Florida growers were in different camps. Uh, one was the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. You, they're the people who bring in the H2 cane cutters and mm -hmm. apple workers further up the East Coast. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and they, 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 of course, that's their business, you know, to bring in these people in. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're inclined to, you probably talk to them. Will you talk to them? Conceivable, yeah. yeah. Uh, Walter Cates. Oh, okay. uh, uh, we'll talk to you about, uh, you know, long-term plans for farm workers and um, big companies using the same workers year-round, mm -hmm. still migrating to their farms in the north They've and coming back again. Coast, yeah, huh? and you know, and I've had long, long conversations with him about all of this. You know, with paid vacations and pension plans and all the rest of it. So, <laughs> um, he's got a ways to go before he convinces anybody in the industry. Right. Right. Um, George Zorn is the real boss of the outfit, and Walter Cates is like the mm -hmm. number two. Anyway. Um, there, they, that was their view of the thing. They would have liked to see uh, the, the amplification of their program. It's just it's huge, and there was talk. And, uh, I don't know if, if you remember any of this, but there was talk about um, contracts with various countries to send labors, and people like like Red China offered, you know, a terrific deal. You know, with a four men for every ten men. Yeah. Kind of everybody, there was, there was a brief period there where every people, countries were falling over one another to send workers. Mm -hmm. right? um, the, I thought the thing was going to go haywire. I remember the, 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 the head of the Presidential Select Commission that set up, that Jimmy Carter set up mm -hmm. to look at the whole immigration scene was Father Hesburgh, the president of Notre Dame, who had been running the civil rights right. thing right from the beginning, right all the way through, you know, and until Nixon canned him. Right? Well, Carter brought him back now to do the new civil rights thing, mm -hmm. which was the one for immigrants. And, um, I mean, I was nobody in this thing, but when I did get to talk to Hesburgh, mm -hmm. I was trying to sell the Palm Beach County picture. Like, we're the people who know H2, mm -hmm. right? and we're the ones who know that this is the worst brutalization altogether of people than the worst that happens in the informal thing with the crew bosses and coyotes mm -hmm, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and we, when this bill passes, it's got to kill H2. Yeah? And Hesburgh was saying, get no bill without H2, and the uh, you've got to give us time to do these things. Mm -hmm. And it took 10 years of of lawmaking to put teeth in the Civil Rights Act, right? Yeah. And it will take a few years of lawmaking to make this new Immigration Act work. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that, you know, we'll get rid of H2 mm -hmm. and so on. And I'm saying, you got to be nuts. Like, if you, you, you give them, you give them H2, then you'll never take it back. Right. There's no way in the world you'll ever take it back. Right. This, um, but I was convinced at that stage that H2 was going to just take over the whole deal. Um, but it has its own deficit, which is that you've got to house the workers. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to go back to being responsible for the camps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I came to town, there were big, big farm labor camps in Florida, you know, and then they just became, they just, they just won't bear scrutiny. Yeah. Right. And uh, so nobody wants to go back. There are camps everywhere, but nobody acknowledges that there are camps and their crew bosses have them rather than the growers. Right. Um, so that, w that was a piece. That, that's one of the things that stops in my business. Um, anyway, why, where am I going with this? We started... Well, one thing I'll, I need to do... And be yeah. be because it's small, you can... Like, it, uh, it, has, it has some kind of manageable dimensions. Right. And right. you can see a few people, right. and they can be models, you know, of, of right. some of the things. Like, um, they, it, 
but it, it has never been, you know, as devastated as, say, Belblade mm -hmm. or, or, or Immokalee has been, you know. Um, but it, it also has this difference. It has no small growers. Yeah. It, has, it's, yeah. it has, it's all corporate. Yeah. Um, the, the Immokalee thing is more, like, Immokalee's in Collier County. Collier is Collier Magazine once oh, upon yeah, a time and all that kind of thing, right? Uh -huh. And it's the Collier County Corporation. Uh -huh. They've got the whole county. And there are only two families of Colliers, I as far as I know, involved there. And, so, and what they do then is they lease the land yeah. to, 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 to these growers, and they supply them with all their seedlings and all really? that kind uh -huh. of stuff. Um, even the gas stations in a place like Immokalee may belong to the uh -huh. corporation. Uh -huh. Then it has... Uh, but anyway, what are the farmers doing? They're speculative farmers. Like nobody can Florida vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, they're too expensive. Mm -hmm. and all this. They grow them for peak market mm -hmm. periods. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And they target. And if they miss their targets, they may plow them under. Right. So they may not be worth the cost of harvesting. Right. And mm -hmm. so, um, now, that bears a lot on the workers because what, that's the reason why you want a massive pool of workers around right. who have no... Um, like no claims on them suddenly the day that you want them. Right, right. Right. But then on the same day, everybody else in town wants them. So right. they get a, they yeah. um, formerly, w when I first started on this thing, uh, there was plenty of work harvest, and one of the things we were always fighting about were short-handled hoes and mm -hmm. all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Well, uh, there's no hoeing at all now. It's all grown in plastic. Right, okay. So mm -hmm. there's no room for... You'll see, you'll see vegetables growing in plastic just as you pass the turnpike on your way out now. Yeah. There's no room for, there, there's very little work in between. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that all adds to the problems of the workers. They, if the, the old, the old uh, formula of having a hiring hall would reduce, radically reduce the number of workers in an area at any one time, mm -hmm. waiting for jobs. Mm -hmm. Give regular work to the ones who had seniority. Mm -hmm stabilize everybody, mm -hmm. mean that people would then acquire a home mm -hmm. in the place, you know, mean that the kids would then go to school. Right. Yeah, just completely change the whole thing. That's right. yeah, this big free-floating pool is right. one of the disastrous things. And so free-floating, you know, that people will they'll take workers all the way from Fort Pierce down to Devil's Gardens near Immokalee to pick lemons on a day, you know, and, and they'll probably pick up 15 bucks a piece and uh, just full of, uh, full of all kinds of crazy. But, but to put shape on it, um, I suppose you do things like that. Why does it behave the way, why does the industry behave the way it does? And yeah. that, that preference for this big, big pool is, is, is a piece of it. And that comes out of that very strange speculative mm -hmm, mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. um, I may make a couple of million dollars in a field of strawberries, or I may, may not make anything. Miss the market and yeah. not make anything. Yeah. So it's really important to kind of almost kind of keep these people impoverished in a way, so that so that you can get them yeah. when you need them, and, yeah. and you don't have any. They don't have any demand. They can't make any demands on you. you right. Know, rest of the time. And once they start acquiring any kind of protections, once the system begins to get softly, yeah, make stuff. Now, what happens when somebody comes along and offers daycare? Yeah. What do you do now? Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Wedgeworth out in Wedgeworth out in Pahokee is kind of a doyen, uh -huh. and so we'll just be right up front about it. You know. We have daycare where we're going to get our poor ignorant workers. Right. Right. right up, straight up front about it. We were in Tallahassee last year, doing the lobbying this access to farm labor camp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. there was a bill to try to win to just allow access for yeah. advocates and so on to yeah. farm labor camps. And it was just soundly defeated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was going around the, the, the day after the vote, appealing to people, you know, to think, rethink it for next year, mm -hmm. for, which was this year, when it was defeated again this year, but not in the same way. Anyway, um, and people were offering to help. And there's one guy there who was a prominent legislator said, you know, I want to carry that next year. I want to, I want to work with you. He's a big grower, grower himself over in Monticello. Mm -hmm. And um, so the whole thing is going along swimmingly. We're great. And I'm 
coming down to see you. But you're going to take me out, and you're going to show me. Mm -hmm. and, um, with me, I have three farm workers, mm -hmm. because when you're doing that kind of lobbying, right, one of them is a Spanish-speaking old man. Every time that we headed out that day, she always went with me. I didn't, didn't get it why at the time. But, um, she can follow the conversation, but when she speaks, she has to speak in Spanish herself. Mm -hmm. So another woman, Marguerite Sinner, translates for her. All her interventions are always terrific. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm delighted with her. But she says something to this guy, and he's suitably impressed. And then Marguerite Sinner goes on to say, you know, her daughter is the first kid in our whole area, in Ruskin, Florida, and the Hispanic farmer community is the first kid ever to finish high school. And he swings around in his chair. His back was almost to me. But he swings around in his chair and said, there you go, you son of a bitch. That's you right to the hilt. You will never set. Every one of these people has got to go to college, right? And he's just, and he starts to run. And that's always there. Yeah, yeah. Like we've yeah, done all yeah, of this yeah. nice guy talk with yeah. all these people. He's just absolutely flipped, flipped out. Right. And, and you're going to take our farm workers right, away from us. Try to right. make these people and, and send them all off to college. Yeah. Now, that was 1991, not, you know. 